Okay, yeah. Great, so this is the last lecture for today. I know it's been a long day, so I'll try to make it as fun as possible. So I'm um, going to talk about uh, language and vision. So in my talk, I'm going to combine um, topics coming from Mar what Marta has explained, from text. When I say language, I mainly think about text and with computer vision. Um, if you want to have an, a review of the topic which are related to this uh, talk, you can watch the videos from last year's edition of the course. So we're going to post the video from this edition, but they are not online yet. But if you want to refresh it, you can watch the one from last year from Antonio Bonafonte, Santiago, and, and Marta herself. So first, the motivation of why is interest of, of dealing, trying to deal with language and vision, which seem to be like very different problems. But you see that uh, under the framework of deep, le le deep learning, in the end, they are quite similar. Um, so in 2016, I had a chance to attend to a conference called CPR, which is the main conference on computer vision and pattern recognition. And over there, there was a speaker called Andre Karpati, which maybe you know him. He, he was a PhD student in, in Stanford, and he published many online material uh, for people to, to train, to learn about deep learning, because he's done a, a great effort in disseminating these, these techniques. And he gave one of the keynote speeches. And at the end of, of, of his keynote, he said, OK, you guys from the vision community, that's I'm from an image processing group, computer vision community, you, what you should do is you should pay a lot of attention of what people in neural machine translation are doing, right? And OK, so that said, that's probably he knows what he's talking about, so probably that's what I should do. So I came back to UPC and I tried to find the people from who are, who are doing neural machine translation at UPC, right? And that's when I found Martin, I found uh, people from TAB like Javier Hernando and so. And we, and as a result, the first thing we did is we organized uh, the previous edition of this course. So we, that's why I'm kind of coordinating uh, this course. So you can blame Andrew Carpati for you being here somehow as well, right? So last year uh, we had this first edition of the course and now it was successful. So you are now here in the second edition. And uh, thanks to this interaction, uh, I had the chance that to ask Mark, like, Mark, like, like you, Andre Garpati told me that you sh I should read papers from your community. So what, what he was referring to, right? And said, oh, that's very easy. That's, he explained what, he just, what she just explained to you in the previous lectures. So you see, that's this thing of neural machine translation. Do it in a, in a nutshell, because now you, you, you had already the, the, the talk, is you go from one language to another, let's say from English to French. And what you need to do is you need to train a network that will in first encode your source language into some embedding, some representation. And then you need another network that should decode it. You go from this Im uh, embedding to a target language. And if you do that, you will solve neural machine translation. You need to know anything about grammatics or orthographics or anything at all. Okay? You just need lots of data, the right architecture, the right GPUs. And, and of course, well, that's not that easy, but let's make it easy for you to be excited and see that think that you can do many interesting things. So that's the, the, the approach. And these encoder decoders, at the end, they can be uh, neural networks. Uh, Marta has talked about different architectures. So you, you know that there's a wide variety there, depending on, on where you are trying to maximize, right? But let's say some kind of neural networks. I, I, I put here multilayer perception, which pro probably is the worst decision you can take, but just as a reference, OK? And that's, what, that's why we are always talking about encoder and decoder architectures. And in the middle, we have the representation and embedding of our information. Um, then also, um, I think Tony gave you the lecture on word embedding. So she also told me about word embeddings and how you can use language models to have some representation, which are pretty cool. So you project your data in a space that it's kind of self-trained. And this representation, they're going to have some interesting meaning. They like similar thematic, semantics will be represented in uh, close by. Uh, areas of the space. So after I learned that, they say, oh, that's cool. Now I finally can understand all these papers that have been out there, actually, when I was in CPR, about uh, image and video captioning. That's what I'm going to explain now. So if you understand uh, Marta's talks, it's super easy to understand w how people do image and video captioning. So image and video captioning means that you have an image or video, and you will generate uh, one sentence, not just one label. Like when we talk about this image net image classification uh, issue uh, task. That means that you have an image, you, you have some amount of predefined labels, and you choose the right one. Captioning is a bit richer because there's some language involved there, right? You want to, to generate a sequence of, of words. So how you do that? 
So that's pretty easy, right? You just need to replace, uh, instead of having a, a, a sentence from um, the source language, now you don't have a sentence from a source language. Now we have an image, right? So uh, you see this graph here. So this graph is an image. It's a visual representation of some content. And this image, this graph, you can uh, represent it with a sentence as well, right? So in that case, what I did is I replaced the sentence in English for that image. Yeah, and now the only thing I need to do is to change the encoder, just to have the right encoder for an image because instead of for a sentence, yeah? And do, have you, what kind of encoder, like what kind of architectures you ha have you seen in this course or in other course to deal with images? What's the, the typical architecture for that? CNN. CNN, right? So your encoder is going to be just a convolution neural network. Typically, typically it will be a convolution neural network. Okay? There, are, there are always many flavors of everything, but that's a classic approach. So yeah, that's it. Um, this thing that for you, for, for you now hopefully it's obvious, uh, some years ago in 2000, 15 or 14, it was, that, was not that obvious and actually it was a super breakthrough in computer vision and language because for the first time some, uh, somebody actually, Uriol Vinyals, you know this uh, former UPC student that we always refer, uh, published his seminar paper like Show and Tell where he did exactly this. He just, uh, he, he, he came from, a fee, from the language field mainly, but he probably somehow he learned about the commercial network, maybe he read the AlexNet paper and he just replaced the encoder for a convolution neural network. And, as, and from that image, you could, he could, was able to generate uh, sentences. And that's image captioning. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all. That kind of seems obvious now. It was not obvious at, at that time, obviously. And actually, there were other, other authors that did similar things uh, at that time. So it's in the, in the same conference, CPR 2015, there was a work from Stanford that they did something very similar. Okay, if you remember, Andre Karpati was the guy who gave me that smart advice. And Lee Feifei is one of the also very famous uh, professor in Stanford who has lots of online co courses and it's uh, one of these evangelists, let's say, on, on AI. Uh, in the case of Stanford, they did uh, quite a similar job. So they took the image, they had a, C a CNN, and they fed that into a sec-to-sec -sec model. So the, the, you feed the image and then you, you input the start uh, symbol, generate throw, throw then is the input to hat, hat, and so, okay, that's a very simple sentence with only two words, throw hat, but that's, that's a concept, right? Then uh, later, uh, Uriol Vinyals and many other people, uh, sorry, not, not Uriol Vinyals here, sorry. So there was this uh, other work uh, called show, attend, and tell, which actually, if you have followed Marta's lectures, you know that you can improve uh, neural machine translation and all these language tasks by adding some attention layer. And that's what they did. They did that, they introduced some attention layers. But in this case, attention over the image, not over a sentence, and they improved performance. Yeah? And they actually, they plotted some of these uh, graphs. Yeah, it works. So if you click here, there are many examples. I just took some of them. But you see uh, two examples where uh, you see the sequence of words that are generating and and a mapping of the attention over the image. So you kind of see that, uh, especially when the sentence refers to one of the objects, uh, semantic objects in the image, the attention is kind of focused over, over them. Yeah, that's the, the concept. And by doing that, of course, that improves uh, performance uh, just uh, because of what Mart explained. Other people, um, if, if you are following, if you follow computer vision, which Maybe that's not your case, but there are another problem in computer vision which is very popular, which is called object detection. Which means like, it's not that I have an image and I generate a label, but I want to really detect the location of the object. I want to draw a bounding box around it, right? And then uh, again, CPR 2016, same team. Now they took what they had learned about object detection, they fitted it in a captioning uh, system, right? And then they, they manage, so this, this super complex architecture, it's a classic object detector with, a, a, with, a, with an LSTM, which is that what you know, to generate the, the descriptions. And they were able to give it an image, to detect the objects, and also generate captions for each of the objects. So now it's not a caption for the whole image. These are captions for the objects that, have, that it also detects. It does everything, yeah? So actually, I, I had the chance to test it in the CPR in that conference. So this is me, and he, uh, okay. 
there's a zoom there, so he takes me like, man has short hair, man with short hair, which is pretty good. That's our PhD student, Amaya Salvador, a woman wearing black shirt, okay, fine. And then both two men wearing black glasses, okay, that's not exactly the point, but ah, that's how, they, they were running this in a laptop, real time-ish, let's say, okay, but it means that it's, it was possible to do. Um, some other people, they took the same idea, like if we can do this for images, why not doing that for video? In the end, video is just a sequence of image. So now, the input, you only have, you have only one image, you, get, you have a sequence, but um, there are different ways to deal with that. This first work from 2015, they were extracting uh, frames. Uh, so here they were extracting the, the features from the images, that would be the encoder, and they were feeding that in two layers of LSTM that generated a sentence regarding the video. That's one of the first proposals for video captioning. And then there was also this, this work the day after, I think it improved performance, where they had, again, these are CNNs, that's the encoder, yeah, that's the encoder, uh, two recurrent uh, layers, because now you have a sequence of images, right? You represent all the video in that hidden state, that would be the, the representation. And then when you, uh, you can, de later you can decode that for that representation to generate the captioning with a, a classic decoder like the ones that Marta presented. You on already saw sides, this work we in have the to presentation, look at whether right? it works that for the UK the or not. Reading, it said security had been stepped up in Britain. Because now you are more, in better conditions to understand what, how they did that, right? So if you look at the architecture, uh, this paper was called What Listen, Attend, and Spell, okay? So from, uh, again, Uriol Vinyas, so that follows the, all the series of papers with this kind of, of titles. So here what they did is they, for the image part, so that these are video sequence, so they actually, they don't fit the full video frame. They first, they run a face it, a lip detector actually, and they find the lips, and they crop the lips. They fit that, but then you have a sequence of lips because it's a video sequence. They fit that into an LSTM. So, well, sorry, they extract visual features. They fit that into, into an LSTM. So you have a sequence of features from lips on the, Upper part, you see this MFCC. Uh, that, that's a, an audio descriptor, super popular. I don't know if, I think nobody has talked about it yet, but I think they will tomorrow when they start speaking about speech. But it's a, a very well-known audio descriptor, okay? And it's not deep learning. So they extracted this descriptor uh, for, for certain windows from the audio track, and they uh, fed that into uh, an LSTM. Uh, then they have a, a, a sequence. And uh, in the end, what they did is they, they fit uh, the, con I think it was the concatenation of, of, the two, of the two outputs in another LSTM that was kind of uh, generating the outputs and being able to pay attention whether to the audio or to the, to the video, to the visual or to the, to the audio features, yeah? So in the end, uh, this is a sec to sec. So that's the, the star sign. That's the input representation of the whole sequence. Uh, I, th I think they, con they concatenated it. You uh, predict the attention over the concatenation of the two uh, features, and that's it. You, you, you just start uh, generating the words that, uh, have with, that correspond to the transcription of the, of the video sequence, okay? In this case, uh, I think I already said that, they are using both audio and video. And in the paper, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure Okay, that's the attention. Yeah, it's not in the slides, but if you look read at the paper, they also run experiments without the upper layer, which would be like the classic deep breathing. And performance is worse, but okay, it's still it's not random, so it's still doing something. Yeah, and that's quite a an active uh, research line now. Like it's a very cool problem to to tackle. So that was related to image and video captioning. Now I'm going to talk about something a bit uh, another. Uh, of these challenges that some people, they consider that it's uh, one of the important milestones for AI, for artificial intelligence, which is visual question answering. So what, how does this work? So again, this comes from the, na the natural language processing community. They have been working for ages on would be question answering, like textual question, and then there's an answer. And then the people from Vision, we said, oh, maybe we could play a little bit with that. Uh, why don't we, post questions about images, right? The way to do it uh, in a overview is that you have your image, you encode it, 
with your, with your CNN. You have your question, you encode it, probably with your LSTM. And then you somehow, here I put a sum, a sum sign, but there are so many ways to do it. You combine these two features, and uh, you, in the end, you decode an answer from the combination of the two features. Okay? And, there's an, and most of the novelty in this field, in many cases, it's how you combine the two representations. So here I put a summation, but there are so many different options, right? So that's, then you can solve problems like this, yeah? And this should be, you should understand how this works, right? If, if you can, let's say, you sum the two vectors or you just concaten concatenate it, then it's, it's again the classic uh, system that Marta presented where you generate as an output. Uh, here is only one word, but could you, you could generate a, 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 a sentence here by, just by decoding uh, a sentence. That would be the, the, the answer to your question, yeah? If you have a large, data set, annotated data set of images, questions, and answers, you can train a network for that. That's actually what we did here at UPC. Um, so we, well, sorry, that will be the, the whole architecture. I'm just repeating what I, what I said in a different flavor. But here at UPC, we had a uh, first implementation in 2016 of one of these systems. Uh, I think that was, I think both years they were Keras, so I think that was the first version, and last year, we had a better version. They are both in Keras in case you want to play with it. But there are also actually many implementations of that. One of the state of the arts at that time uh, work is this, is this one where uh, they had a, a convolutional neural network pre-trained pre with ImageNet images. So they just pre-trained for another task for image classification. Um, they obtained some features. They had a GRU. So one of these other cells for uh, language modeling, uh, they had this GRU that would encode the question. They somehow combined them, and that's where the novelty is, because they did something called dynamic parameter layer, which, okay, whatever, they did something weird to combine it. And up on this, on the result of the combination, um, they trained uh, another layer that would output the answer, okay? In some of these cases, because that's, there's a challenge there, so there's a, uh, annual competition on this, where uh, the competitors, and I, th I think this represents to this, to this solution, the competitors, what they do is they, they, they have the training data set, they look at the, let's say, top 1,000 most frequent answers, okay, and then they consider that each of the top 100 most frequent answers is one class, and then they solve the problem as a classification. So they are not going to, to output a sequence of words, which will be like, the cool, I don't know, it's the cool or nice way, but the, the one that better adjusts to what, we, what I've been explaining, what Mark has been explaining, but they just treat the problem of answering to a question as a classification problem, okay? And maybe to win a challenge, that's, that's a good idea, okay? I, I think that top performing teams, they were doing that. Of course, you, 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 you are, if you do that, you are limited to the amount of top 100, top 1,000 most frequent sentences. But then it's easier to train, and maybe it's, it's good to, for your task. Maybe that's, that's enough for your task. If you know that your, the answers for, for your task are limited, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe you, you are building a chatbot, and the chatbot can, should give just one of these answers, and that's it. Maybe it's better to treat the problem as a classification problem instead of, of treating the problem of, of having to generate a sequence of, of words. Um, there has been this work also uh, two years ago where they introduce uh, some, uh, something called a memory cell, where uh, it kind of allowed some reasoning. That's the, the, uh, the idea where we are heading now. And because nowadays, what, uh, okay, sorry, there's also some people did uh, grounded questions, means that you, you provide an answer on the, on the, on the, regarding the image, but then you also say uh, your answer, uh, where is it looking at, okay? So you, you provide the answer, and also you're telling like where the answer is located in the image. That's when you talk about grounded. This is a question answering grounded or grounded language. And when you see the word grounded, visual and grounded language, it refers to these kind of problems. Some other works, what they have done is visual dialogue. So in this case, this is a, a game where, uh, let's say, two bots, they, they are trained to play a game, and they are trained with doing reinforcement learning. And well, I think they're explaining. But the idea is that 
one of the bots must identify, given a collection of images, must figure out which image the other bot chose, right? And so one bot poses question, the one that cannot see the image, and the one that sees the image answers to the questions. In the end, the one, the, the bot that cannot see the image uh, will choose, okay, that's, that's the, we choose among uh, a subset of images, the one that the first bot took, yeah? This train with reinforcement learning. So if you are familiar with these learning strategies, that, that kind of makes sense, like kind of a game. And that's people from, these are people from Facebook and they are doing very nice works on, on this direction. Lately, there's a lot of effort in some, a problem called visual reasoning, which is, um, which is trying to tackle one of the limitations of when you solve tasks like visual question and answering. In some cases, uh, some of the most, what they do is they just learn the, the bias of the data set. So they just even don't look at the image. They just, based on, on just by looking at the question, they just answer the most probable uh, answer and, and that's it. And then, so some people, they are trying to build better data sets to, to, make, to make this kind of behavior not possible. But some of the people, what they say is, uh, we are building a much harder questions, okay? So in this case, there are questions like, are there an equal number of large things and metal spheres in this image? And answering this question, that you need to, to know uh, what are large things, uh, what are metal spheres, uh, what does equal number mean? So solving this, it's much harder than that. What's, what's the, um, that man wearing on his hat, which, on his head, which probably will be a hat, even if I don't look at the image, yeah? That's, and that's another kind of, of test. So there's this uh, also recent work uh, where they solve this task actually by uh, training a network that, that it somehow, uh, codes, a program that allows solving the, the task, okay? But they, you read the paper, you see that, that they, they, they reconstruct the task in different, let's say, operations, and then they, they have a network that will kind of write the program to, to solve the, the task. To conclude the last examples that I want to explain, it's about something called joint embeddings. And also, they, we are trying, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, if you remember, I said that you have, I don't know if I, yeah, you have a diagram. You you can have encoders for the image or for the text. And uh, what happens if we use these encoders not to go from one to the other, but to go uh, from one to uh, some representation in one high-dimensional space, which is the same one, normally, which is the same one. It's related to this other. So you see this image, visual information contains the same. Let's say you can think that it contains the same information to the sentence above. Okay, why not learning uh, a deep learning model that will generate the same representation for both, whether for text or for vision? Okay, what that's what's called joint embeddings. Yeah, and you can and you can train for that. You can train weights that. So you, if your data set has pairs of these images and captions, you can uh, maybe you can. First, you freeze that, that, that encoder and you project it, and then you train this encoder so that the, the projection of this image goes to the same place and, and the other way around. Yeah, and then sometimes, sometimes you train one, sometimes the other one, and you, you do that iteratively. At the end, you can really obtain uh, models, networks that will uh, project your data into the same place. Some examples about that. Uh, this idea actually comes from 2013 in NIPS. There was w this paper where what they did is they trained, uh, let's say, a CNN with ImageNet, like to classify images. They also trained a language model, like the ones you, you've seen with Antonio, I think. And then once they had that, so, but, but here there are it's just language model. Here there's no, there are no images at all, and here there are no sentences at all. There's no language involved, right? Then you take these models, you use these weights, and then you add. Uh, new layers on top that will aim at, at what I was doing, like uh, when I have pairs of image labels, so now I will have pairs of image label, then I will train uh, the, this transformation mainly, actually you, you train this one, or you can find you know, so this one, so that, that if you have the image or you have the label, they are both predicted to the, to the same place in, in space, yeah? 
Okay, now, what's the use of that? So now I'm going to show you an example of what's the use of that. If you do that, you could be able to, to do something called zero-shot sh zero learning. So imagine that in your, um, in your, let's say here, that in, in, in your data set here, you don't have any images of cat, okay? You don't have any images of cat, but they were in, the, in your, but the word cat was in your language model. So you, you can map them somehow, right? Um, then what it could happen is that when you, uh, here you have this, the manifold of known classes. This will be the, all the classes that you, you know the pairs of image label. But if you, even if you didn't have any uh, image set of, of cat, if, if you train it uh, all together, you, when, when you have uh, an image of cat, you can put it here. This will be projected somewhere, okay? And this somewhere, actually, uh, you can look later at what's the closest word to that representation. And that closest word could be cat. If you, everything works well, could be cat. So you can, in the end, um, detect cats even if during training, your network, you never show a cat there. Yeah? Um, and it actually, actually, it will be based on the language model. It will, it will see that. It, it's kind of assuming that similarities in language, they, are kind of, they, are, they also map in language, which maybe cats, tigers, they are visually similar, and probably they appear in similar sentences. And that's one of the tricks. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's, okay. it's one, one way. Zero-shot learning is very tough, OK? Like having your network to recognize something that it has never seen, it's tough, but we, we humans, we, we can do it. If somebody explains some concept, but we never see it, and then we see it for the first time, we are, based on the language, we are able to recognize that concept. Okay, here at UPC, we've worked on this on, on the field of sentiment analysis. Um, I think I'll skip this part. And I wanted to show this work, which, because it was very popular. That's uh, this work from my previous student when she was at MIT. So what she did, she trained a joint embedding, okay, to solve uh, this task where you predict the recipe of, of, a, of a dish, okay, uh, based just on a picture. He actually solved it by doing joint in bed. Yeah? You understand? So that's a video because they are. Okay, that's, that's the demo they have, but basically you take the picture and he will give you the ingredients and the recipe. And the opposite way. If you have a recipe, you will find uh, images that show you how the recipe should look like. Yeah? How did she do that? So that's, 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 okay. so that's a word from Amaya Sabado when she was at MIT. So you, she had, uh, she wanted to go from image to recipes. Actually, she can do the other, the, both ways, but I guess that the, that the cool app is to take a picture and, and get the recipe. And what she did, she, she trained a, a joint embedding. As I was saying, she had the image, she trained uh, some neural, neural network that was uh, mapped into some representation. And she also, uh, she, has, she had a large data set of images and recipes and ingredients. Then she could also go from the instructions or to ingredients to this joint embedding, okay? And when, what she did is like when she had a new image, she fit it here, got the representation, had a large data set of recipes, okay, and looked for the, reci the representation of the, rep of the recipe that was closest to the representation that was generated from the image. Yeah, and that's, that way you, you, you retrieve. It's not, it's not generating the words, it's just retrieving. So it's searching in a data set and just show you the, the, the recipe that matches the, the image. Yeah. Okay. But these are how she did in, in the details. She used a Skigram model, a language model, actually, and a CNN for the image. There's a, another work from uh, Luis Casterhon and other people, but Luis Casterhon is former UPC, and he's, uh, he's, he's, now, he's now at Mila. And he did something like given uh, an image uh, in any modality. So you see, these are all images, uh, natural image, uh, graph, drawing. This, this is, this is um, so this word is sky, castle, wall, and road, okay? So he wrote the, he wrote the letters of the concepts on a, on a layout, okay? And these are, of course, a, you know, a kid drawing of a mountain. Then what he did is he, he collected a data set of, of uh, the same, let's say, concept in the different representation, different visual modalities. So here there's language, that's why I put it here. The rest, of course, they are visual, but here there is language. There's the, 
the layout, and he trained uh, joint embedding for, so that's the kind of the network that he trained. He trained a, a joint embedding such that wherever you come, whether from natural images, from sketches, from clip art, to special text or uh, descriptions, everything was mapped into the same representation. So given one, he could retrieve the other ones. And that's, that's, that's the results that you, that you find here. And I think that's all from my side. Um, if you have any questions about what I presented. Nope. Okay. Then I think I'll leave you with Jose Adrian and probably with the project. <laughs>